Hey everyone, I'm Josh and this is Josh Wright Piano TV. Today I wanted to give you a little behind the scenes look into how I record my podcasts and also the full podcast episode. I don't usually do too much cross-contamination between uh, my YouTube channel and the podcast. It was meant to explain things in a little bit more clarity from an audio standpoint. That's why I started the podcast, also to help blind pianists, because we actually have quite a few blind pianists that watch this channel and um, have asked me to explain things in a little bit more detail. So this is a look at how I record a podcast. I'm using the same microphone as I uh, usually use for my YouTube videos. Generally, I'm just recording the audio, so I will hook up the Apollo Twin Duo or the Zoom F6. I love both of them. I just have the Apollo on my piano and I travel with the Zoom F6 for concerts, so I just keep those separate just so I can have a quicker static recording set up uh, here at home. They are kind of sixes so far as the sound quality. I like the portability of the Zoom F6 a bit more, but today we're gonna be talking about motivation and how we can kind of get out of a slump if you're experiencing discouragement. And this video is dedicated to two of my students. One of them is a member of the Pro Practice Lifetime Access course, and another one is one of my Skype students. And we were talking about a few different things that I wanted to touch on in this podcast. If you would like to subscribe to the podcast, I will link um, in the description below uh, that. It is through Anchor. Uh, Anchor pushes to pretty much all podcast platforms. So you can just follow that link and then, or you can just search for it. It's called the jo Josh Wright Piano Podcast. So without further ado, here we go with today's podcast episode. Welcome to the Josh Wright Piano Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about three tips for motivation. This episode is dedicated to Rajesh and Effie. Rajesh is a member of the Pro Practice Lifetime Access course. Uh, my course online that covers some very popular repertoire and exercise pieces. Um, I will link that in the description below if you'd like to check that out. And Effie is my Skype student and we were having a really good conversation the other day and I thought a couple of the tips that I gave her tied in. We're going to go over three things today. The first thing I wanted to discuss is what is your motivation? You need to define that really clearly. Rajesh said, I want to be famous. Uh, I want to be a famous musician, but why do you want to be famous? You really have to define that. I always thought that I wanted to be this really famous musician that was touring around the world and playing with all the major orchestras. And while I would still love to play with a lot of major orchestras, that sounds really fun, uh, I noticed that I started to enjoy traveling less and less um, as I traveled more and more uh, in my career for concerts. And once things calmed down, I actually have enjoyed teaching and making these podcasts and YouTube videos and pro practice videos and all of these different online endeavors that I'm doing along with teaching at the university and teaching privately. So you have to define what your motivation is. Why do you want to pursue music? What elements of music do you want to master or you know search for mastery with because i think all of us no, none of us ever achieve true mastery and then you need to adjust your goals uh, so rajesh are you really wanting to be a famous mu musician or are you wanting to be skillful enough to have the option to perform and that's a much more definable goal i want to be famous is something that's fairly empty in its ambition, uh, I guess you could say. Whereas gaining a certain skill or mastering a certain piece or exercise or performing for someone and gaining that skill of performing better. We did a podcast recently on performance anxiety and stage fright and some tips to overcome that. So all of these things I want you to be thinking about defining your motivation. The second thing I want to talk about today is this concept that I've heard on so many different podcasts and in business books. I love reading business books. I definitely am an entrepreneur at heart. Um, I love building things. And it says, you are the average of the five people you hang out with the most, you spend the most time with. And my brother-in-law, uh, my wife's brother, was on this recent trip with me and we were talking about this. And he said, you know, I just don't have that many motivating people to 
hang out with. He's like, I like hanging out with you and hearing these ideas to build a business, but how do I find more people like that? And I turned to him and I said, Ben, I spend 30 to 60 minutes a day with someone at the gym just listening to their podcast. I arguably, besides my wife and daughter, uh, I arguably spend more time with those individuals. I consider them my mentors, even though I've never met them. I'm spending more time with them than almost any other human being. Uh, so finding outlets of motivational sources to help you get that motivation, to get out of that funk, to get out of that discouragement. I know for me, um, there are just a few podcasts that I like listening to. One of them has a lot of swearing in it, so I'm not going to name those podcasts, <laughs> but he's a amazing entrepreneur and businessman um, that just motivates me every single day to get out there, keep posting new material for you guys on this podcast, on my YouTube channel, updating my courses, finding different ways to bring value to others. So think about that. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with and read books, listen to podcasts, watch these, um, watch YouTube videos, listen to, uh, you know, if you're into piano and you enjoy this podcast or you enjoy the way I teach, spend time with me each day. Or if you love Sergei Babayan's playing, which I love his playing, he's my favorite pianist, I will listen over and over and over to his few CDs <laughs> that he's released. I'm very frustrated that he's not more famous because I would love if he had a huge discography. Unfortunately, he only has about five CDs out, I think. And I listen to those all the time and I listen to his YouTube recordings. Luckily, his student, Daniel Trifonov, uh, T-R-I-F-O-N-O-V. I think he is equally as brilliant. Obviously, um, he is Babayan's student, so Babayan is the true master, but Trifonov is equally masterful in his technique and his approach. He's just one of the greatest pianists of our generation, if not the best. I mean, I, I hate defining the best, but I like to spend time with Daniel when I need inspiration to uh, prepare in a more... I just said the word inspiration, but in in a more inspired way uh, for my concerts. So, or maybe it's Murray Praya or Marta Argerich or Rubinstein or Horowitz or any of these wonderful pianists, Mitsuko Uchida, especially if I'm playing Mozart, I spend a lot of time with her, even though I've never met her. I've met Babayan and Trifonov and a few other famous pianists, but for the most part, I spend time with them each day. I remember hearing someone... Uh, in my undergraduate degree, they asked me a question. They said, how much money would you pay to have a lesson with Arthur Rubenstein? I said, I don't know, maybe a thousand dollars, you know, just throwing it out there. They said, well, it's free. You can have a lesson with him this afternoon. And it was a little less impactful because I knew he had already passed on, but I was like, oh, okay, I get what you're doing here. But it's true. Throw on a recording, maybe even put on a pair of headphones and play along with him and those nuances that he takes, learn it exactly how he plays it, just for a short time. I'm not saying you have to be a copycat of Rubinstein, but for a minute, it's almost like you're sliding your hands into his and you are uh, exploring the rubato that he's using and you're exploring the voicing that he chose or the dynamic scheme that he's trying to follow or, oh, I'm going to resolve this phrase here. So Think about that. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. With technology these days, you can pretty much have any mentor you want. It's a magical thing. The last thing is I want you to think about playing things that you love. And if you don't love something, but you know it's going to help your skills, go ahead and pursue that. But I was talking with my student, Effie, and she said, you know, I don't really love this piece. <laughs> I, I've i played it and I've got it to a level that's high enough, but it's not perfect. It's not performance ready, in my opinion, to the level that I want it to be. And I said, what are some skills that you're wanting to gain out of this piece? And she said, well, certain textures and speeds, but I feel like I've already got that. I just, I'm lacking that last little bit of magic. And I said, there is such a giant piano repertoire out there that why would you spend your time laboring over a piece that you don't really love when you've already extracted all the skill gaining out of it that you set out to gain in the first place? Um, 
even if it's not quite as beautiful as you want it to be, even if it's not as nuanced or the rubato is not quite there, but it had a more technical element that you wanted to learn the piece for, then maybe you move on. Or if there is something that you're trying to gain from it and you still haven't got to that level, maybe you press on then. And generally I like, I like the latter because I like to take most things to a performance level that I'm satisfied with. But there have been instances where I have worked on certain pieces and I felt like I extracted all of the use out of them that I needed to get. And I didn't particularly want to perform that piece, but I learned it for a specific reason to develop a specific technique or musical style. And then I let it go. And there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of perfectionists have a huge problem uh, with doing that. They think I'm, I'm a failure. I, I didn't ever get it as perfect as I wanted it to. Well, you could spend years on pieces. I've played that Chopin first ballade for, I guess it would be, let's see, 18 years now. I learned it when I was 14 and I'm 32 now. I don't get sick of that piece and I love it and I keep playing it at concerts because people love it and I love it and it's just a wonderful piece. But there's other pieces I learned when I was 14 that I haven't touched since then. And uh, I got a lot of value out of them when I was studying them, but then I let them go. That can also be a big source of motivation, working on things you love and care about. Now, if you just love playing rags, well, maybe there's certain passages in your rags or blues or whatever it is that you're wanting to play that require a bit of classical training or jazz musicians in my history classes. They were always so nice to me. They're like, man, if we had your chops, we would just die. But I'm like, yeah, if I had your mind, an analytical mind of knowing how to analyze pieces like you do, because you know your harmonies in and out, like, oh, that's a G7 flat 13 and that's resolving to this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's just makes my head spin a lot of times to analyze it to that degree. I know I probably should be doing that more, but uh, the, everybody has different skill sets. So maybe you you work on something for a specific reason, but you are willing to let it go. And then you can really spend time doing what you love. It's kind of like you, you read these, I've read these books about, um, you know, you're not going to become rich by saving a dime on coffee. But if coffee's not important to you, then maybe you cut back on that and make your own at home so that you can spend lavishly in a different area of your life that you do care about. So cutting out things that really aren't bringing value to your practice sessions to focus on things that will bring more value, but still maintaining a good balance of things that you enjoy is one of the quickest ways to gain more motivation as well. I know this wasn't just a pump you up type episode, like you can do it, but <laughs> I hope the tips that I've explained here can help each of you um, evaluate where you're at in your motivation level. And if it's lacking a bit, hopefully these tips can take you up to that next level. If any of you have any questions, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. If you wouldn't mind subscribing and leaving a review, that helps to spread the word about this podcast and help uh and help some more people find it, I would be truly grateful. I will also provide a link for uh, my free webinar to take your playing to that next level. It uh, goes over 10 tips that I use every day in my teaching and my personal practice. They're 10 of my favorite tips that I've ever learned, actually. So I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, because I am featuring this as a behind the scenes episode on YouTube, I will leave that in the description below. And I will also leave some links to my social media outlets, to my paid courses. So all of that is found on the link tree link. So that will take you to a page and you can just choose what you want out of that page. So I hope all of you have a great week. If any of you would like to submit requests for future podcast episodes, write to me. My email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com and put the word podcast in the episode or sorry, in the subject line of the email. Have a great week. Good luck in your practice sessions.